let's describe complex numbers using polar coordinates. I'm going to start off with a drawing of the complex plane. So over here, we have the origin, and this is the horizontal and vertical axes. So this axis, the horizontal axis, I'm going to label the real component of the complex number z. And this is going to be the imaginary component of the complex number z. So the horizontal axis corresponds to the real component, and the vertical axis corresponds to the imaginary component. Now, this guy over here, I'm going to call z. This is going to be your complex number. So z sits somewhere on the complex plane. Just for simplicity, I've put it somewhere over here in the upper right quadrant. But it could be anywhere. It could be down here. It could be anywhere on the plane. So this guy, what we're going to do is we're going to take the complex conjugate of z, and that's going to give us the reflected version, and that's going to be this down here. This is what I'm going to call z star. And the star notation, that tells us that it's a complex conjugate. So the complex conjugate of a complex number is the reflected version over the real axis. So what we're doing is we're taking the imaginary component and we're negating it. So let's break this up using Cartesian coordinates, and then we're going to impose polar coordinates on this. So this over here, this value is x. That is the real component of z. I'll write that up over here. So x is the same as the real component of z. And this over here, this is i times y. And this down here, this is minus i times y. So we have a minus sign because we've taken the complex conjugate. So this, I'm going to write up here as well. We have y is equal to the imaginary component of z. And what I also want to do is I want to label the magnitude of this complex number. So the magnitude is the length of this line that goes from the origin to the point. I'm going to call that r. So this is going to be r. And I'll call this one r as well. So it's also r. And r is the same as the magnitude of z. So the magnitude of z, that is the same as r. And what I'm also going to add to this diagram is an angle. So this angle and this angle uh, are actually going to be added to the diagram. This angle is theta. That's what I'm going to call this guy over here. And this guy I'm going to call minus theta because it is actually the same angle, it's just in the downward direction. So the way that we're uh, defining this, the convention is that the positive real axis is 0. So this is 0. Anything that's positive, a positive angle, is up from the real axis. And a negative angle is down from the real axis. This is just the convention. And what we're going to do is we're going to set this equal to 0. And then over here is going to be pi radians. And if you go all the way around the circle, you come back and you have 2 pi radians. So what you can do is you can actually add 2 pi radians to every angle, and you will have the same physical meaning. So it's the same meaning if you add 2 pi radians, because uh, th that's the thing with periodicity. If you go back around, if you go one full revolution, you come back to the same angle. So you can represent the angle using infinitely uh, many values, as long as you add an integer multiple of 2 pi. And 2 pi radians, that's a full revolution around the circle. So that is this angle theta and minus theta. So now what we have is some Cartesian coordinates, and we have some polar coordinates as well. And we've got some relationships written down over here. Now I'm going to start writing z and z star in terms of these uh, Cartesian and polar coordinates. So we've seen this before. We've seen this in the previous videos. We've seen x plus i y. That's something we've seen before. And we've also seen that the complex conjugate can be written as x minus i y. But now what we're going to do is we're going to transform this, and we're going to turn this into polar coordinates. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to use some trigonometry. What we can do is we can take this x distance, and we can turn that into something that involves trigonometric functions. We can do the same thing with the imaginary component. So I'm going to rewrite this as r cosine of theta plus i times r sine of theta. And I want you to see where this is coming from. If we have a unit circle, then the horizontal distance is given by cosine theta, and the vertical distance is given by sine theta. But this is not a unit circle. This is a radial distance r. So we have to scale this up 
by a factor of r. So that's why we have r cosine of theta and r sine of theta. Another way of looking at it is uh, Sokotoa, right? This over here, the sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse. And this is the opposite, and this is the hypotenuse. So we have y, this is the height y, over the hypotenuse r. So I'll write this up here. Sine of theta is equal to the opposite, which is y, over the hypotenuse, which is r. Sine theta is y on r. And what I'm just doing is I'm saying y is equal to r times sine theta. And that's where this is coming from. y is equal to r times sine theta. That is this relationship. And the same thing is happening with cosine. Cosine of theta, well, that's adjacent over hypotenuse. And adjacent over hypotenuse, this is the adjacent, and this is the hypotenuse. We have x over r. So this is x over r. I'm just multiplying both sides by r, and that's giving me this relationship. x is the same as r times cosine theta. If I move this r to the other side, and that's this relationship. And y is the same as r sine theta. So that is where that's coming from. One way we can actually do this, we can rewrite this in, a, in, a, in another interesting way. I'll do that underneath. This is the same as if we factor out the r, this is sometimes written as cis theta. And you can see where the cis comes from. We have cosine i sine. But this is not a very useful notation. It's actually uh, very rarely used because it's not very convenient to work with. A far more convenient notation is the exponential notation. And that is r is equal to, uh, or r times e to the i theta. And this is Euler's identity. So we can rewrite this in, with Euler's identity. Just factor that r out, and then you have cos theta plus i sine theta, that is e to the i theta. And this is the far more useful notation. Right? This doesn't tell you anything. This is not very useful when you're multiplying or when you're adding. But this is fantastic for multiplication. If you're multiplying complex numbers, this is the form you want to put them in. Polar form is very convenient for multiplication. So that's why we're going to be using this when we define uh, some variables and when we actually derive trigonometric identities. We're going to use this to derive trigonometric identities because this guy can be re rewritten in terms of cosines and sines. And so you can use uh, the power of exponent laws and trigonometric functions to derive very useful relationships. So this is the polar form. Now, what is that going to look like for this guy over here? Well, for this guy, what we're going to have is r times cosine theta minus i sine theta. So I've just factored that r out. And what have I done to this i? I've turned it to a minus i. So this i has become a minus i because I've taken the complex conjugate. And you can see that x over here is r cos theta, and minus y is the same as minus sine theta times that r. So this r can be brought back in. We can redistribute that r. And that r can multiply both of those guys. We can use the same reasoning that we used up here uh, with the trigonometric functions. And again, what we can do is we can turn this into an exponential function. How are we going to do that? Well, if we turn this into an exponential function, it's going to look like this. We're going to have r e to the minus i theta. Now, why is there a minus sign over here? Well, that minus sign has originated from this minus sign. I'll show you some reasoning as to why that is true. If you take theta and you substitute it into cosine, it's the same as substituting minus theta into cosine. So I'll write this over here. Cosine of theta is actually the same as cosine of minus theta. So the cosine function is actually a, a symmetric function. So it's a symmetric function because if you take the negative angle, it gives you the exact same output. So minus theta is exactly the same as putting in theta. So that's why you can actually put a minus theta and it doesn't change the cosine. But it does change the sine. The sine, S-I-N, has a different sine. That's a plus minus sine. So what happens to it is if you have sine of minus theta, that is equal to minus sine theta. So can you see that this over here, this minus sine on the inside, minus times theta in the cosine, doesn't change the sine of the cosine. But it does change the sine of sine. Because, now it's very confusing because I keep saying sine and sine. This is the sine function, and this is the sine over here. It's, it's the negative or plus, so plus or minus. 
So if you put a negative angle inside here, that's going to translate to a minus times sine theta. So that is why this works over here. That is why we can have a minus sine over here, and that, that's why this minus sine appears up here. Because what we're doing is we're, we're taking this exact form, and we're substituting a negative angle, and that negative angle is not changing cosine, but it is changing sine. It's changing sine to minus sine, and that's what complex conjugation does. So this over here is the complex conjugate of this guy. So complex conjugation is very easy in polar form. All you have to do is change the sine of this angle. When you change the sine of the angle, you have complex conjugated. And that's equivalent to changing this sine from minus i to i or i to minus i. And if you complex conjugate twice, you get back to where you started. So the complex conjugate of this is this, and the complex conjugate of this is this. So the reflection of the reflection gets you back to where you were. So this is a very important property. I also want to draw a little, uh, little sketch that will illustrate this symmetry and anti-symmetry. So cosine uh, looks like this. So this is cosine if you draw it out. So you can see that if you put a negative angle, it gives you the same height. So this is the same height. If you have, if this over here is theta, that's this guy, and this is minus theta, you will get the same output. This is the same output for the cosine function. So that is why it's a symmetric function. But the sine function, which I'll draw over here, the sine function looks like this. So this is what the sine function looks like. So if you have theta over here, and if you have minus theta over here, what the output you're going to get over here is this guy, and the output over here you're going to get is this guy. And this is actually the negative of this. You can see that this is on this side, and this is on this side. So this is symmetric, and this is anti-symmetric. So that's the property of the cosine and sine function. So this is just a graph of the sine and cosine function for uh, real inputs. So you're putting in a real number, which is an angle theta, and you're getting out a real number. So all of these guys are real numbers. But everything on this plane is a complex number, which has a real component and an imaginary component. So we've seen what complex conjugation looks like in both Cartesian and polar coordinates. Cartesian coordinates are a lot more easier uh, to do addition with. So if you want to add two complex numbers, it's a lot easier to do that if it's in Cartesian form. But in this form over here, we can use exponential laws when we multiply these guys together. And that's actually just going to make this into a very uh, easy multiplication. I'll show you an example. If we want to find the, the magnitude of this complex number, that's going to be the same as the magnitude of z. And what we can do is we can take the square of that, because that's easier to find, and that's going to be equal to z times z star. And let's do that using this uh, exponential form. That's going to be equal to r times e to the i theta times r, and then we're going to have e to the minus i theta. And what's going to happen? We're going to get an r squared, and we're also, that's an r times an r, and then we're also going to get, using exponential laws, we're going to get e to the i theta minus theta. Right? We get a theta from here, and we have a minus theta from here. Theta minus theta, that gives zero. So we have e to the zero, and e to the zero is one. So then we're just multiplying this by one, which is r squared. So that tells you that the square magnitude is equal to r squared. And that's actually the same. If you square it both sides, that's the same as this relationship here. The radial distance, that's the same as the magnitude. So you can see how multiplying uh, these guys together is very easy in this form. If we were to multiply this form times this form, we would have to foil it out. We'd have to take the firsts, the lasts, the outsides, and the insides. And that's actually going to be uh, a lot more tedious. So multiplication in Cartesian form is doable, but it's not as convenient and simple. You can see this is just a few lines, and uh, actually just a few steps, and you can just combine these guys together using exponential laws, and that just gives you a very simple way of multiplying. So this has been polar coordinates for uh, complex numbers. We have introduced Cartesian coordinates, and we've introduced polar coordinates. We're going to use this e to the i theta form in the next few videos. It's going to be very useful especially when we're looking at trigonometric identities. Trigonometric identities can be derived very easily using complex numbers, and especially using complex numbers in polar coordinates. And 
Another final note, if you're looking at complex numbers that have a magnitude of one, those are complex numbers that sit on the unit circle. And that would just correspond to setting R equal to one. And if R is equal to one, you just have E to the I theta. And that is a unit circle in the complex plane. So if you want to keep uh, learning about these useful mathematical topics that are going to help for quantum mechanics, make sure to check out the quantum mechanics playlist. There's many videos just like this one. You can find those videos if you click over 